So then, last week, we launched our new season at Lakeview, calling for an all-hands-on-deck to join in on what God wants to do in us and through us as individuals and as a church community. And the idea that we are using to unpack that invitation is that God's renewal comes by serving and not ruling the world. And last week we talked a bit about binding and loosing and how Jesus has empowered us, his church, to bind and loose heavenly things on earth. That is, that we have all the power that we need to make things right, to bring wholeness, and to work towards God's win-win. And if you were here last week, you might remember that we had a 1959 Chevrolet Apache on stage to press the point that you and I, we need to be open to new things, to the new things God wants to do, beginning with ourselves. So what that means is we need to posture ourselves to be open to a new way of thinking, to be open to a new way of doing. The work remains the same, But adapting to change and meeting our challenges head on is what Jesus is inviting us into. So today I want to carry those ideas along, spend some more time talking about them and talking about divided loyalties. We're going to talk about the economics of God's kingdom and finally a two-toned 1971 Ford 150. All of that and more, but let's start right here. Walking along the beach of Galilee, Jesus saw two brothers, Simon, later called Peter, and Andrew. And they were fishing, throwing their nets into the lake. It was their regular work. That's important. Remember that. Jesus said to them, come, follow me. I'll make a new kind of fisherman out of you. I'll show you how to catch men and women instead of perch and bass. They didn't ask questions, but simply dropped their nets and followed. A short distance down the beach, they came upon another pair of brothers, James and John, Zebedee's sons, and these two were sitting in a boat with their father Zebedee, mending their fish nets. And Jesus made the same offer to them, and they were just as quick to follow, abandoning boat and father. Now, you might remember that we have spent some time in this passage in the past, but I want to revisit it very quickly this morning because it's going to inform where we're headed. So here's the deal. Jewish boys, starting at age six, would begin their formal religious education. And by the time they hit age 10, the pack would begin to sort itself out and the best students would move forward and those who weren't the best would not. But it's those that were moving forward, they were moving forward with a particular purpose. The hope for them was to do all the education so that they could, in the end, become rabbis. But for those who didn't make the cut at 10 years of age, they would go back home with their families and they would learn the family trade with their parents and their extended families. Meanwhile, those who had gone on by the age of 14, the best of the best were still studying. And each one of them was waiting to be hand-selected by a rabbi and to hear the charge, come, follow me. Because you see, the rabbis were looking for apprentices, for people that could do the things that he did. So if you were a student and you heard that invitation, you had that charge, you would leave your home, you would leave father and mother, and you would devote your life to learning to do what the rabbi did, to essentially become a disciple of that rabbi. Now fast forward to what we just read. You got Peter, Andrew, James, and John, and the rest. They are plying the family trade. So why are these dudes fishermen? Because at one point in time in the past, they weren't good enough. At one point in time, they didn't make the cut. So Jesus calls his band of underachievers to come, to follow him, to be his disciples because he believes that they can do what he can do. And so the boys drop their nets and follow because someone thinks that they have what it takes. And oh, the adventures they had. Oh, the places you'll go, Jesus must have thought to himself. 
And then you know how the rest of the story goes. Jesus is crucified, he rises, and then he appears to his disciples a handful of times before he departs to fetch and send the Spirit. Yet on one of those occasions, Jesus finds his disciples in a very peculiar place. Here it is. After this, Jesus appeared again to the disciples, and this time at the Sea of Galilee. And this is how he did it. Simon Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel from Cana and Galilee, the brothers Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. And Simon Peter announced, I'm going fishing. And the rest of them replied, we're going with you. And they went out and got in the boat. Huh. What do you think's going on here? These guys have just had the ride of their lives the last three years. And then things get really crazy, and then Jesus dies, and then Jesus appears to them after they've seen him die. Once he shows up on the roadside, another time he's walking through walls, and in this episode they're going to meet him on the beach. But something has changed for the disciples. They've become discouraged. They're likely overcome with worry and insecurity. They had this life-changing experience with Jesus, but now they've returned to their old life. They've gone back to doing the things they used to do before they encountered Jesus. In this moment, the disciples are living in between loyalties. So with that image in mind, the scriptures ask us a question this morning. And the question is, have you ever been stuck? Have you ever been stuck between the old you and the new you? Have you ever felt this tug of war between who you want to be, who you aspire to be, who you feel called to be, and who you have been? Or maybe there's another question in there for you this morning, and it might be this. Are you overcome by discouragement and insecurity today? Do you feel like you don't have what it takes to make the cut, let alone to keep up? I want you to know, if that's where you find yourself today, you're not alone. Because strangely enough, becoming a disciple of Jesus does not make us immune to life's challenges and troubles. If anything, it lowers the boom and raises the stakes. Jesus says, don't think I've come to make life cozy. I've come to cut Make a sharp knife cut between son and father, daughter and mother, bride and mother-in-law. Cut through these cozy domestic arrangements and free you for God. Well-meaning family members can be your worst enemies. If you prefer father or mother over me, you don't deserve me. If you prefer son or daughter over me, you don't deserve me. If you don't go all the way with me through thick and thin, you don't deserve me. If your first concern is to look after yourself, you'll never find yourself. But if you forget about yourself and look to me, you'll find both yourself and me. Sounds like being a disciple of Jesus is a terrible idea. Is that what the disciples were experiencing? Is that what stretched their loyalties? Because I'll be honest with you, that would stretch mine. And hold on a second. Doesn't Jesus oppose the sword? Isn't Jesus someone who likes peace, who brings peace, who values peace? So how are these words from Jesus congruent with the Christian life? Maybe this will help with our understanding. The demands of the kingdom are so offensive to a world already convinced of its rightness that they provoke that world's hostility. 
So maybe what Jesus is saying here is this, is that our loyalty to God and to God's renewal of the world is going to stir the pot. Maybe what Jesus is saying here is that if we drop everything, that is, the places we find our comfort, security, and safety, if we drop those nets to follow him, that kind of stuff is bound to happen to us. Maybe, on top of that, Jesus is also saying, I'm just giving you guys a heads up. I'm just giving you a warning. If you're going to follow me and these things are going to happen, I want you to be ready to meet the change and challenges of this world with the power of my kingdom. And funny enough, in the earliest records that we have of the church, that's exactly what our forerunners did. You might be familiar with this passage that all believers were one in heart and mind. And no one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put them at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. Now, have you ever come across this passage before and scratched your head and said, what is going on? Why are they doing that? Well, I think now you might actually know. The reason that these first Christians, this first church, had to step up for one another is because Jesus' warning had come true. Those who had pledged allegiance to Jesus, to the growing numbers of disciples who had left old loyalties, the initial consequence was economic. We are talking about people who had been expelled from their families. Foreigners who were left in the lurch and easily oppressed. Widows who had now been cut off from support. In essence, these people were put on the scrap heap and left for dead. So the church, never having faced this situation before, first time, has to adapt and form new policies and adapt new patterns to serve this changing world. Because it was the ethic of those first Christians that no one had the right to more than what they needed. But please don't see that like a fuzzy, feel-good, warm, hallmark movie of the week moment. That's not what it is. The action of those first Christians was a bold-faced refusal to play along with Rome's guiding ideals for power and survival. So what we see in these first Christians is the economics of God's kingdom at work. And the list we read, the things that they did, is not a static list of requirements, which means you don't have to go home right after this service and put a for sale sign on your lawn and sell everything you have and then give the money away. That is not what this passage is saying. Why? It is far more inspiring than that. Think of it this way. Follow the trajectory that we've been on this morning. When loyalty to Jesus and to the way of Jesus takes precedence in our lives, it's going to stir the pot. And when that pot is stirred, there is a reaction. And that reaction is a new opportunity to witness to the good news of God's renewal. It's another chance for God's new way to present himself. And the response of the church in that moment is a bold-faced refusal to go along with evil and brokenness. And that refusal takes shape as a radical economic distribution like we see in Acts. Now, sometimes that redistribution is a monetary one. 
Sometimes it's about listening. Sometimes it's about giving your time. Sometimes it's about jumping into deep pools like truth and reconciliation and creation care. Sometimes it's about your spouse. Sometimes it's about your kids. Sometimes it's about how you even see yourself. And most times, you are not even sure what you're dealing with until it's right in front of you. So then you might be wondering, what does any of that have to do with a two-toned 1971 Ford F100 pickup? I thought you'd never ask. This truck actually belongs to my friend Aaron. And when I asked him about this truck, he said this, I've always wanted to rescue a truck from the scrap heap, from the wrecking yard. And when I went into that particular yard on that particular day, I sort of had an idea of what I was looking for. I wasn't quite sure. But once I saw this one, oh, I knew it was the one. It's the one I had to have. And it's taking him a year to get it into this condition that it's in right now. But he didn't do it by himself. He had the help of his grandpa Dave, his friend Dwight, Mom and dad are supporting and footing the bill, you know, and that's happening. And also his uncle Ryan, which I have been told that if Ryan didn't show up, there'd be a whole Flintstone situation with the floorboards. And if you are too young to get that Flintstones reference, stay off my lawn, dirty kids. <laughs> There's something about the backstory of this truck that for me, I think, hits all the right notes and ties in to the things that we have been talking about this morning. This truck came off the scrap heap. Once upon a time, someone said, enough, done, gone, and it was left for dead until Aaron showed up. And Aaron brings it home, but he doesn't do all the work himself. No, there is this shared knowledge. There is this shared time. There are these shared tools. You could call this a radical economic redistribution. Aaron didn't necessarily have all of those things. Oh, but his friends and family did. And they showed up. And they shared all of that freely. Now, I am told that unexpected problems arose. And my guess is some more are still going to pop up. But they will all be dealt with. Why? Because now Aaron is invested. You could even call it an irrational loyalty. Because all the work, all the time, all the effort really doesn't make much rational sense. So there must be something more. And I think that irrational loyalty feels like a good way to describe the scriptures that we have unpacked today. Because sometimes discipleship in the way of Jesus really makes no sense. It invites trouble, it is inefficient, it causes strife, it costs money. But really, it's only irrational if you see your life and the situation that this world is in as a competition and not as an opportunity for welcome. Think about it like this, that the future of humanity is not just in the hands of politicians and corporations, but in our hands. Peace will come through dialogue, through trust and respect for others who are different, through inner strength and a spirituality of love, patience, humility, and forgiveness. The crisis that will come will then not just be moments of danger, but opportunity for dialogue and unity and solutions will emerge.
Listen here closely. Lakeview Church is not in competition with anything or anyone. But this morning, can I offer you a better image for the church? In service to God's renewal, can we assume a welcoming posture, an open posture for whoever? If it's someone who's here or someone who's not here yet, can we recognize when we take this open posture, there's room. There's room for you and for me and for whoever. So hop on. Join in. But are you a bit worried? Because you might say, oh, I got a lot of trouble. I got a lot of baggage. I say to you this morning, bring it. Bring it, bring it. Is anybody out there with hard questions? I mean, really hard questions about Jesus, God, church, etc. I think we got room for that. What about the doubters? We got doubters in the room this morning? Pieces don't quite match? Okay. Uh, any failures in the room this morning? You can raise your hands right now. Okay, thank you for those hands. Terrific. What about the rest of you who feel very inconsistent, caught between loyalties? Don't get down on yourself for that. Instead, see them as great opportunities to once again experience God's renewal. So my friends this morning, I want you to walk out of this place knowing this, that your life is not a competition, but an opportunity to welcome and be welcomed into the better way. So your challenge is this. Join in. Join in and receive God's offered welcome.